Hello, everyone. Hello. So what, 10 minutes today, you think? Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Um, <laughs> it's always a wish of mine. Anyway, um, uh, very good. Uh, hey, folks. No worries. Take your time. <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. All right, uh, welcome to the State Department. Uh, just a quick topper uh, on Secretary Kerry's travel to Nigeria today. Uh, obviously, uh, earlier today, Secretary Kerry did arrive in uh, Sokoto uh, from Nairobi and is currently, I believe, in uh, Abuja. Uh, while in Sokoto, uh, the Secretary had an opportunity to meet with and engage with local religious leaders on how to counter the influence of violent, violent extremist groups. Uh, you obviously have seen his remarks, uh, many of you, uh, on this uh, community building efforts uh, to counter violent extremism and the importance of good governance and strengthening democratic institutions. Uh, he then traveled to Abuja, where he had the opportunity to meet with uh, President Buhari. They discussed Nigeria's economy, the fight against corruption, human rights issues, and of course, Boko Haram. He also later met with the foreign minister, uh, Onyama, uh, who, and northern governors, rather. Uh, tomorrow, the Secretary will meet with anti-corruption NGOs and will then travel onward to Jeddah, and we'll have more to share with you on that tomorrow. Matt? That's it. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Seems no, just concise. kidding. Sorry. I'm going to answer all your questions <laughs> in a yes or no. <laughs> really? Uh, okay. No. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a, a, a nice, uh, first, a, a nice change. Nice yeah. Um, let's start Sorry. with the story that doesn't seem to want to go away, and that is the payment of the Hague judgment, um, or the settlement. Uh, claim. So yesterday it emerged in various news reports that the judgment fund, which Treasury runs, um, had put, posted, you know, kind of hiding in plain sight, 13 payments of 99 million nine hundred ninety nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars and ninety nine cents, um, which, if you add them all up, comes to just under the 1.3 billion that you guys have needed still to pay the Iranians. Um, since the Department of State is listed as the defendant name in the case, uh, I don't think that there's much use in you trying to say that this was not the money for Iran, considering the history of these payments on, the, on, on their website, which doesn't show anything close to that for the rest of this year. So first of all, I've got a couple things on this. The first thing is, one, if you add it all up, you're 13 cents short. <laughs> have the Iranians asked for their 13 cents, or are you guys holding it on, on, on to it for leverage in the next, uh, for the next release of prisoners? Are you actually asking me that question? Yeah. Uh, uh, we paid well, in full. You paid in full. So this was the money. I, I don't know. Uh, I, I've seen the document to which you're referring. I have not had a chance to, to double check it uh, or check that its accuracy uh, do well, you have any reason to believe that it's not accurate? It's a I, government I website. I don't. I just don't know. I, I, I'm just not aware of the documents. Uh, so you didn't see. I don't have any comment on it. I don't. It seems to me that one might, that since this came out, one, you might have expected a question on it, no? Uh, we've been very clear about uh, drawing the line of what we're going to say about the actual financial transaction. All right. Uh, and... Uh, bearing in mind that it touches on uh, certain confidentiality, uh, third parties and other parties uh, who might have been involved in that transaction, uh, except to say that we have paid the settlement in full. Yeah, but trying to say that it's confidential now after it's on a website that and is publicly accessible to anyone, except maybe, I don't know, people in North Korea, <laughs> um, is just seems to be uh, – you know, it, it just seems to be a bit ridiculous. Uh, anyway, I, other than other than the, to, to be honest, Matt, I, I'm just not. You know, I I, I know uh, I've seen the document, uh, but I don't have any further comment on it. Right. Well, can I ask then? It raises a broader question, sure. which is which is the, the, these transfers uh, appear to, certainly appear to be have been made by wire, uh, not paid in, uh, you know, ca actual cash. And if that is the case, I'm wondering why it, uh, how it was done, and if, even if you can't answer that, 
why you couldn't have paid the $400 million in the same way. In other words, what made the payment of the $400 million different, not in terms of what the money was for, but what made it different than the payment of the interest? Uh, well, uh, I'm not sure if I can give you a complete answer on that, to, to be perfectly Any honest. Um, you know, we've talked before about uh, the fact that when this uh, – so a couple of thoughts. One is that um, we did not have uh, a relationship with Iran, uh, bank to bank or financial relationship with Iran uh, leading up to this uh, settlement payment. Uh, that was established or solid, uh, given uh, the somewhat strained relations that we've had over the past uh, – since 1979. Uh, and so uh, it was not necessarily an easy or straightforward transaction to make. Now, whether that was later uh, amended, uh, I can't speak to that. Uh, yes. for, the, for the balance, for the interest, that is what but, you're but, referring to here. But you're suggesting that there might have been some change in your banking relationship between the 17th of January and the 19th of January that would have allowed this to – I don't know. The 18th, as I recall, was a federal holiday. So I don't um, – you don't know? I don't know. And we said I we're mean, not going to talk about this. <laughs> this stuff keeps coming out, drip, 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 I drip. I understand that. And if you want to put this – if the administration wants to put it behind – itself, it would seem to me that it would be smart to actually get an answer to these questions. Because as you made note of yesterday, yours is one of the rare – one of the few federal agencies that gets up every day in briefs. Treasury certainly does not do that. Treasury doesn't. They, they are not in the most transparent administration in history. They are not very transparent. In fact, they're probably extremely opaque. So why is it that you can't get an answer? This is not secret. This is out there on, on the Internet. It's on a federal – website. Matt, I'm, you know, uh, I'm aware of your and others' concerns about this. Uh, I can only say that there are uh, reasons for us withholding this information. I'm talking about the details of this information uh, to protect the confidentiality, uh, and that's all I can say all about right. it. Can you, you, so you can't – you won't even – you're not even in a position to confirm that these – 13 payments of 99, 99, 99, 99. Uh, whatever, I can see if we can confirm it. Okay. I'll you what? I will look into it, as I have in the past. Uh, and, by, and just let me clarify. By, when I say I look into it, I'll look into it. I do look into this stuff. It's not that I'm trying to hide or, or pass the ball or hide the ball in any way whatsoever. If you guys think that I enjoy standing up here and getting continual questions from you about the process here, I don't. No. And I, and I want to try to be forthcoming with information. I, I'm not accusing – it's not you that's the – it's not you that's the, that's, that's the, anyway. the issue here. Okay. It is this hell-bent desire to keep this stuff secret when it's not secret anymore. Anyway. Yeah. One, one sure. Follow up on this. <clears throat> Implementation day for the JCPOA was January the 16th, 2016, correct? I just checked. That's right. I mean, yeah. It, it yeah. was. Yeah, yeah. That's right. So is it not conceivable that – the subsequent payments were able to be made in the manner in which you made them because, because the sanctions, implementation yeah. day had occurred and because the, the sanctions, sanctions had been, been lifted. That's actually released. a very valid point, Arshad. I'll look into it and see if we can confirm on that. Can I Please. follow up on this? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Now, you said that you withheld uh, the money because you had last-minute thought or you were worried that uh, Iran might renege on its delivery of, right. of the prisoners. What, what made you that what, – what gave you that impression? Well, we've talked a lot about this, um, but I can uh, no, quickly, I mean, was there any no, no, particular? Okay. I can quickly summarize. I mean, essentially, you know, we had a very dynamic situation on the ground. We were trying to make sure that our American citizens who uh, were being detained uh, by the Iranian government uh, were safely uh, on a plane uh, out of Iranian airspace um, at the final moments, uh, as is often the case with these kinds of uh, high-stakes uh, transactions. Uh, uh, and by transaction here, I'm talking about we were right. also releasing right. uh, Iranian uh, prisoners who were in U.S. prisons at the time. Um, but uh, at the final moment, there were some uh, issues that arose uh, uh, with the family of one of the detainees. 
uh, and uh, and because of that, uh, we took the measures we took. Okay, so it's not a precedent that Iran has done in the past where they reneged on something similar, a similar kind well, of thing. Well, I think, Said, I think that it, we didn't know. Um, and, and again, that's, that's what others have said is, you know, we didn't have, shall we say, a relationship uh, founded on uh, trust with Iran, and we still don't. Um, you know, uh, we have been able to reach agreements with regard to their nuclear program, with regard to this uh, Hague settlement, and in other areas uh, with them, but they're not based on trust. Which, which is why I think there's a lot of people who are, you know, unhappy with that deal, and that's why this issue would keep coming up endlessly. Yeah, and I agree. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of unhappiness. I, I certainly acknowledge that um, with, uh, you know, some of the uh, the agreements that we have reached with Iran. Um, you know, we're by no means saying that whether we're talking about the Hague settlement, whether we're talking about the nuclear agreement, um, and the release of our detainees that all is well and all is perfect with Iran. We've never claimed that. What we have always said is that uh, preventing them from uh, attaining a nuclear weapon, getting our detainees, our American citizens home, uh, settling this claim, and saving the American taxpayers billions of dollars is in our national interest, and we stand by that. Great. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Another New subject? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> there are two questions, Mark. One, uh, if you have seen uh, GPS, uh, Mr. Fried Jakaria, this Sunday on CNN, what he said again that uh, why they hate us means he was talking about jihadis or uh, ISIL and all those people who kill innocent people, uh, whatever their ideologies. But one thing what he said was that the reason is that somebody means he said Saudis are financing some of these people, including some madrasas where they teach hate and uh, uh, all these uh, things. So are you, have you looked at into the Saudis monies are still pouring into these madrasas and to these jihadis in the name of uh, charities and among other things? So uh, he, that's what he said, main thing is financing and then training goes into madrasas, including in Pakistan. Well, look, we're aware of these allegations. Uh, we've talked about it before, we've spoken to uh, uh, not just with respect to Saudi Arabia, um, but others in uh, where you see the financing of uh, suspect organizations. Um, and this is something we discuss with the Saudis, uh, but uh, we're also uh, working with the Saudis, as we are with other countries and like-minded countries within the G GCC, uh, about ways to combat terrorism and work together on counterterrorism efforts. And that, those discussions and cooperation are ongoing. And one more thing is going about sure. Saudis that uh, they have no human rights and respect for the women and still uh, those things are still continuing that uh, have you ever talked about this uh, uh, respect for the women and the human rights and all those things that we, when we talk about human rights, universal human rights, UN we, human rights? We talk about human rights with the Saudis. Um, and again, I would encourage you and anyone in this room to look at the uh, our annual human rights report and what we say about uh, Saudi Arabia. It's a concern without a doubt. Um, you know, we raise these issues uh, regularly with them, uh, and we're going to continue to do so uh, in the context of, obviously, our broader bilateral and regional cooperation with Saudi Arabia. May I have one more on the region, please, quickly? Uh, quickly. Uh, including the Washington Post uh, agreed uh, first for the first time that uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, he opened the Pandora uh, on in his uh, independent day speech in uh, India that uh, uh, the time has come and world must look into this, uh, what's going on in the occupied Pakistan, Kashmir, and also Balochistan, because nobody knew before what's really happening and what the army is expressing those who stood and stand for freedom and for human rights and also for free and fair elections. Okay. <laughs> Washington Post also said that nobody knew before Prime Minister Modi spoke about this, what's happening in the Kashmir in Pakistan. So have Nobody you? Nobody uh, knew. I'm sorry about what was happening with in the occupied Kashmir in Pakistan, because everybody been talking <laughs> about only Kashmir in India, but nobody has ever spoken about well, Kashmir we, in Pakistan, because well, I, I, that's I, what I've been saying sir, for many, well, many years. I would respectfully beg to differ. I mean, we do have concerns about the human rights situation there. I have reported it for several years in our human rights report, and we've obviously. Uh, 
are always urging all parties uh, in Pakistan to work out their differences uh, peaceably and through a valid political process. And with respect to Kashmir, you know, our policy there is well known. Please. Yeah, sure. Uh, you, you have Syria? Uh, okay, thanks. I'll get to you. Sure. In, uh, in Nairobi, Secretary Kerry had mentioned that the U.S. and Russian teams were reaching the end of uh, their discussions uh, on the Syria issue and uh, possible cooperation. Do you have any update on where those discussions stand? Uh, yeah, no, uh, obviously his uh, remarks still stand. Um, uh, we are continuing those discussions. We um, continue to make headway. Um, we're not quite there yet, um, but I don't have anything to really update on, on, the, on the status of those talks, except that, you know, as the Secretary said, we, we hope that they can be concluded and we can reach agreement soon. Please. If I'm not mistaken, was that you, you hope to reach a conclusion <clears throat> one way or the other? When you That's said, correct. when you said, we <laughs> he said, I wouldn't express optimism; I would express hope, is what he said. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But he also said one way or the other. And what you just said, though, is we continue to make headway. We're not quite there yet. Mm -hmm. That seems to me that that you are tilting it in the direction of optimism or hopefulness that you will reach an agreement with the Russians. Well, look, I, I think, you know, again, um, I, I don't want to lean into this too far uh, for the obvious reason that anyone can see that there's still challenges that we need to overcome before we can reach uh, uh, any kind of agreement with Russia uh, on the way forward in Syria. Um, you know, I think that the, what the Secretary said yesterday and holds true is that our teams uh, have been meeting continue to meet, we'll meet this week, uh, and uh, continue to look at those issues and, and see if we can overcome them uh, in a way that's positive and constructive. Um, you know, everyone gets the urgency here, so, you know, we can't uh, look at the situation, especially around Aleppo, and not feel a sense of urgency. And, uh, and I, I think the Secretary uh, uh, stated, as I said, his hope uh, that, uh, that we can get there. So uh, just to make sure we're all operating from the same dictionary definition, when you when you say headway, that you mean there's been some progress when you continue to make headway. It's not. It, it, well, again, I, I you know um, uh, by headway I mean sure. I, I you know I think we continue to hold these con these uh, discussions with them, uh, with the clear objective of getting to an agreement. We're not there yet, obviously. I understand, but, but where you say I'm, this is basically trying to yeah. just trying to get a draw a fine point on yeah, your answer to Arshad's question, which I mean, they, you can continue to talk and just beat each you know beat each other up and not make not make any progress. But when you say you continue to make headway, that suggests that at least there has been something to make you think that it is worthwhile well, continuing think, these well, talks. Well, again, I don't think we'd be talking still if, if we right. didn't believe there was some. Mark, on what yeah. agreement are you talking about? Or are you trying to reach? On the political situation, on the transition, on the future of Assad, on the cessation all, all, all of hostilities. The I mean, what we're talking about is basically what came out of the meetings in uh, Moscow. My calendar, internal calendar scrambled, I think it was a month or so ago, uh, uh, probably more than that. Uh, but when he held meetings in, in Moscow, and then out of that, there were these subsequent meetings at the kind of working group level. Those continue. But again, the clear objective here is, you know, we want to reach uh, a nationwide sustainable cessation of hostilities, similar to what we had in place uh, early on uh, uh, in February, I think. Um, and then we also want to get, once that's in place, the political process uh, started again in Geneva. And that remains the goal. Um, that's what we're fixated on. Uh, obviously, the situation in and around Aleppo uh, over the past month or so has uh, only, uh, uh, as I said, increased the urgency, but also complicated those talks, of course. But we continue to hope to make progress. Mark, on, uh, there's a sure. ceasefire that has just been implemented or announced in Hasaka, you know, in the fight between the, uh, the, the Syrian regime and the Kurdish forces. First of all, do you have any comment on this recent ceasefire? Did you, have, did you play a role in bringing it about? Uh, do you think that the threat that the United States posed to the Syrian uh, forces may have played into that? Uh, what is your comment? Uh, yeah, I don't have much. I mean, we've seen reports about the, the ceasefire um, around the Hesica, as you mentioned. Um, uh, you know, uh, 
in that certain area, um, and I think I said this yesterday, our, our forces haven't really been involved in that uh, area. Um, but, you know, obviously anything that would uh, allow uh, the Syrian Democratic Forces to focus on <coughs> the real enemy, which is uh, the ISIL, and combating and defeating ISIL would be welcome, but we don't have much to, more to comment on that. So in, in this case, the United States was driven by an urgency of its Turkish, Kurdish allies being targeted by the Syrian regime, but you don't feel the same kind of urgency as far as the other opposition groups are concerned because we didn't see any movement of airplanes or any threats or anything. I'm not sure I understand the, the exact Well, my question, question is very ahead, simple, please. that, yeah. you know, when, when the Kurdish forces were threatened by the, you know, when the bombardment was going on by the Syrian <coughs> forces, by the Syrian air force and so on, you moved and you threatened and you said these are our forces. Is it because your forces are there? Because American personnel are in that area, or or is it because you know you have a more solid, solid alliance with the Kurdish forces than you do with other opposition forces? Well, I, I think the Department of Defense spoke to this, and we're quite clear that wherever uh, U.S. Uh, forces, uh, without getting too specific about where those forces may be operating, but right. wherever they're uh, uh, in danger, right. uh, we're going to act accordingly to protect those forces. Um, and uh, I think in the case of Hasaka, um, it, it was in close proximity, some of those airstrikes, to where some of our forces were operating. But again, that's not to imply that we had involvement in that area itself. But, you know, as you know, our role uh, in northern Syria of some of these forces is really train advisement of, uh, of these uh, Syrian Democratic Forces, and that takes place in different locales. So does that preclude the presence of American personnel in any other part of Syria? Uh, we're not going to speak to that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah Nicola. Um, change topic? Of course. Uh, sure. Are we done with Syria? Good. Thanks. Sorry. You just have a Syria question? Yeah, yeah. So there, uh, I'm late in the I don't know that this question will be asked here or not. So there's a uh, major shift in Turkey's policy about Syria. Uh, they just said they, they just gave the green light to uh, President Assad for the for the peace settlement there. I hope you have seen those comments of the uh, Turkish Prime Minister. So how how are you watching the situation? I mean, they are now considering Assad as a president. They are supporting him for the peace process now. The I mean, look, I refer you to the uh, Turkish government to speak to uh, uh, its intentions. Uh, but you know, look, Turkey has been a, a, a valuable partner uh, in the counter ISIL coalition remain so, uh, despite some of the internal uh, crises that they've been dealing with post-attempted uh, coup. Um, Vice President uh, uh, Biden was just there. Um, this, no, I think he's gone now, but, uh, but was there uh, and had good, fruitful meetings with the government and his counterparts. Um, uh, with regard to uh, the future of Assad and, uh, and the political process, Turkey is also a member of the ISSG, the International Syria Support Group. Um, they're there for a reason. We consider them a stakeholder in Syria's future, uh, and uh, we value their uh, counsel uh, on the way forward to reach a peaceful settlement. And I think that's what uh, they have expressed as well. They understand the threat that they are under, probably more than, well, not than any other country, but, uh, but they're under a serious threat from ISIL, as we've seen from uh, numerous uh, terrorist attacks. They understand the threat that ISIL poses. They're part of the coalition. Uh, and then with regard to the political transition and uh, post-Assad government, they're also signed up to UN Security Council Resolution 2254 and uh, are a part of that transition as well and an active member of the ISSG. But, yeah. Sorry, on, on this issue, uh, Turkish forces have bombed today uh, Kurds and Arab forces in Membij who are supported by the U.S. Do you have anything on this? Well, um, we're in contact with Turkish officials uh, as well as uh, representatives of the Syrian Democratic Forces uh, on this incident. Uh, I would say that we're working to ensure that tensions don't escalate, um, you know, and to remind both sides or both parties that uh, ISIL is the main enemy here and the common enemy that must be confronted and that our efforts need to be geared uh, towards ensuring that all of our partners remain focused on that goal. The latest on Iraq, Mason? 
Over the nice. weekend, two major figures complained publicly that political preparation for the liberation of Mosul is badly lacking. They include the Kurdish President Masoud Barzani, as well as Iyad Alawi, former Iraqi Prime Minister, very pro-American. I understand that Baghdad is in charge of this, but Alawi said, quote, we do not see any serious steps by the Iraqi government to coordinate and prepare the environment during the Mosul liberation and post-liberation. Is this something, this question of Mosul, that you are discussing with Baghdad? Are you assisting them in formulating a post-ISIS plan for Mosul? Yes. Um, and I think I, I spoke a little bit about this last week, uh, and our special envoy, Brett McGurk, was just in the region and, in fact, held uh, meetings uh, with both sides or uh, with uh, uh, Kurdistan officials as well as with uh, – um, or Kurdish officials, rather, as well as uh, Iraqi uh, government officials on this very issue, um, you know, looking forward uh, towards, uh, uh, you know, what needs to be done next in terms of going after ISIL in Iraq and keeping the pressure on them. Um, you know, we're regularly engaged uh, uh, with both the central government, as I said, and uh, the regional government in Erbil um, about the necessary political and military steps that need to be taken uh, to make sure that uh, we're successful in liberating uh, Mosul. And um, I can say yesterday uh, their ambassador there, Stuart Jones, uh, held a press conference where he also reaffirmed the United States' commitment uh, to provide assistance to the Iraqi campaign to defeat uh, ISIL on the battlefield, but also – and we talked about this a great deal – how to make sure that humanitarian assistance quickly follows and stabilizes these uh, liberated areas. So bottom line is we're aware of the tensions and the questions and the issues here. We're working closely with uh, all the parties uh, to try to remain – or try to, rather, uh, maintain a consistent uh, front uh, that keeps the pressure on uh, destroying and degrading ISIL in Iraq. Please. <coughs> she had a question, and I swear I'll get to you, Michelle. Okay. okay. Afghanistan. What do you oh. think about currently situation in Afghanistan? Can uh, I just finish? Do we have? Are you? Were you on? Still, I apologize, but were you no, still on? Tur oh, Turkey. we moved to. You see, you're in Turkey. Let's okay. go Afghanistan. Okay. No, let's go Afghanistan. I apologize. Yeah, I just the battle continue between Taliban and Afghan forces in Afghanistan, and upcoming conference, Brussels conference, also very close. What is your ex expectation from the donors that they will be in uh, Brussels conference soon? So, I, I'm sorry, your, your last part of your question, I just want to make sure I heard it correctly. The uh, Brussels conference also, you know, uh, will be very soon. And the Brussels conference, you said? Brussels, Brussels, Brussels conference for Afghanistan, okay, yeah. yes. Um, what, what's your expectation from the donors? Well, look, I, I don't want to um, uh, prejudge the outcome of a donors conference. I could just say that everyone is obviously uh, committed to uh, – will attend that conference – is committed to um, – a successful, prosperous uh, uh, future for Afghanistan. Um, you know, we're aware this is fighting season. There's been some challenges. Uh, we've seen that certainly in Helmand Province over the past uh, uh, or recent weeks uh, where fighting has been uh, quite intense. Um, and our efforts in terms of security remain focused on, uh, you know, working with Afghan forces, making sure that they've are capable, uh, equipped, and able to uh, confront and defeat uh, Taliban on the battlefield. But obviously, as we've also talked about, you know, we uh, would like to see an Afghan-owned, Afghan-led peace process established between the government of Afghanistan and the Taliban. Um, and that remains our desire. Uh, and I think that, you know, the sooner we get there, the sooner we can have uh, uh, a settlement uh, that's in the long-term interest of uh, Af the Afghan people and, indeed, the region. Um, in terms of the political situation, uh, you know, we strongly support and continue to support the democratically elected government of Afghanistan. Uh, we understand that there's uh, there's challenges, work to be done, but uh, we, uh, we've also seen some progress. Uh, we're going to uh, uh, encourage the government and its leadership to work through current tensions and to uh, uh, continue to uh, 
work for the good of the country. Good. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah, uh, on Turkey, uh, yeah. Uh, do you have any doubt on the U.S. delegation meetings in Turkey? You're talking about for the vice president? No, the DOJ officials and the State oh, Department. Oh, uh, yeah, no, I don't, unfortunately. I, I'll try to see if I can get more for you on that. I don't think I do. Let me check very, very quickly, but I don't think I have uh, anything to, uh, to read out at this point. Now, obviously, he's talking about the uh, team from the Department of Justice that uh, has gone to. State Department? What's that? And State Department. And State Department, but I don't have any kind of, uh, of readout for you. Okay. But this is something we had talked about, I think, previously, that the, these teams we offered, in fact, uh, to send these teams uh, to uh, cooperate with Turkish officials uh, in the aftermath of the coup. And uh, staying in the region, uh, Secretary Kerry has called uh, uh, his uh, Egyptian for, uh, foreign or his uh, Egyptian counterpart. Any, any readout for the phone call? I do not. Thank you. Turkey, where was Turkey? Turkey, go ahead. Uh, so over the weekend, Turkish Prime Minister told reporters that if needed, Russia could use its airbase at Incirlik to launch airstrikes uh, against ISIS in Syria. Is the U.S. concerned that could actually happen? And if it did happen, how would the U.S. handle sharing uh, a runway with Russia? Um, so I'm aware of those, uh, those comments, um, and of course, uh, you know, uh, we have in our uh, private diplomatic uh, conversations with uh, Turkey sought clarity on what their uh, what the implications of those might be. Uh, uh, I don't have really anything to add other than that we continue to obviously uh, use Indrelik, Um and we used it all through. As I said, the uh, uh, the um, Uh, the aftermath of the, the well, uh, the the coup attempt, and then the aftermath of the coup attempt, where Injilik was uh, affected, uh, without a doubt, uh, by uh, those events. Um, we deeply appreciate, frankly, uh, uh, Turkey allowing us to use Injilik because it allows us to carry out uh, airstrikes in close proximity and support for uh, the Syrian forces that are or Syrian democratic forces that are fighting in uh, in northern Syria, and we want to continue that relationship. Um, I don't think we're there yet in terms of – I don't want to project uh, what Turkey may be uh, uh, leaning towards uh, with Russia. Um, you know, we – and we talked about this at the beginning of the briefing uh, – are in conversations with uh, Russia about um, a way forward in which we focus on uh, combating exclusively ISIL and Daesh and airstrikes focused exclusively on ISIL and Daesh. Um, but we haven't seen that completely realized yet, and Aleppo is a perfect example of that, where you still see strikes hitting civilian targets and certainly moderate opposition targets, uh, and that is uh, not helping the overall situation in Syria. And again, reaching uh, – you know, we, we're all, you know, uh, at least uh, uh, trying to reach for the same goal here, which is uh, a peaceful political transition and a credible – a cessation of hostilities, but I think that, at least on our side, for our part, uh, we're still not convinced we're there yet uh, with the Russians, but we continue to work uh, uh, in that direction. Do you have any indication that Russia and Turkey have been talking about uh, using that air base? Uh, not specifically on that air base. Uh, you know, there were obviously uh, – there has been a, a rapprochement, if you will, between uh, Turkey and Russia in recent weeks. Um, you know, that's for the Turks and the Russians to speak to. They're both members, as I said, of the ISSG, the International Syria Support Group, both stakeholders in uh, what happens in Syria, uh, with regard to what happens in Syria. Um, you know, as much as we can have a, con a better and more constructive relationship with Russia with regards to Syria, we would certainly uh, want the same between Turkey and, and, and Russia. Um, for our part, we're not there yet. One more thing. Go ahead. Go ahead. Fatul Gulan, is there any update on the extradition request by Turkey? Uh, I don't have an update other than the fact that it was at least a part of the conversation that was uh, taking part um, uh, uh, for these working groups that, that, that are visiting uh, Turkey or in Turkey right now. Um, uh, I do have one slight update and one slight uh, – uh, not slight, but one uh, additional point of clarity because uh, this came up with regards to the extradition request uh, last week. Um, 
So we can confirm now that Turkey has requested the extradition of Mr. Gulen. Uh, but uh, I wouldn't characterize the, the request as relating to the coup attempt. Um, in fact, they don't relate to the uh, 2016 uh, attempted coup. I don't have other further details to provide other than that, except to say that we have, as I said, re we, we have received uh, uh, a formal extradition request, just not one pertaining to the uh, coup attempt. Uh, in the, well, so we talked about the, the tranches of documents uh, that we've received in the past uh, several weeks. And uh, uh, I think once we assessed those documents and made a full assessment of those documents, uh, we were able to make that determination. So it's not that you received a new document, no. it's that your assessment of the right. documents. Right. Why did it take so long? Uh, I think we were, uh, A, trying to work our that way through the documents, uh, and B, uh, uh, trying to uh, work with uh, C if Turkey was going to add additional uh, documents to that charge. Is that, is that new guidance from today, or was it from before and your no. your, your so it's no, new not, today. I mean, it's not what, today. I think I, I you think know when the decision was made. So that I, it was a that it, well, uh, the decision was made. I don't know when the decision was made that this didn't, that, that this was a formal uh, uh, extradition request. That this constituted a formal extradition request. I think it's relatively new. Like I said, in the past several days, um, but I do know that it was also mentioned. I believe uh, as part of the vice president's uh, visit. I think one of the backgrounders that they gave in relation to that. And yeah, if it's not related to the coup, exactly what. Uh, I, I, well, I said I don't have additional to? details to provide. It's obviously related to other reasons for which they want him extradited for, but I don't have the specifics on that. And I, I offered that this information uh, with some hesitation because we've talked about all along we don't talk about extradition requests or extradition processes, um, but and yet we do. but <laughs> but um, we felt uh, I felt that we owed you an answer to that because. Uh, in the early days, we, Secretary and others, talked about the fact that there is an extradition uh, treaty with Turkey, and once we do receive a formal extradition request, uh, we would acknowledge that. Well, can you say whether then um, the what you have been doing up until <clears throat> the last couple of days <laughs> has been related only to deciding whether the material the Turks submitted amounted to a formal extradition request, or in other words, are we now in the stage where, where you are actually considering the merits of the request? My understanding is that we're considering, we're now in the stage where we're considering the merits of the request. And prior to this point, um, you had only been con determining whether or not the documents that they had submitted amounted to a formal extradition request under the treaty. Is that That's correct? My understanding. Well? So in other words, the process for deciding on whether or not to extradite him has now begun. And prior, pri prior, to, prior to you determining that it was an official extradition request, that it had, it had, that was not what was being considered. Is that right? Again, I don't want to, you know, uh, necessarily wave a red flag that the process has started. I, I think that there was a period of assessment uh, as they worked their way through this, the, the, the material that was presented. And I think in recent days, slash weeks uh, that it was determined that these did constitute formal requests or a formal request, but that it wasn't related to the 2016 coup. And what was right. attempt. intended to right. announce this today? And Tomorrow, the... I apologize, I didn't hear what you said. Why did you intend to, to, to announce this statement today and tomorrow Vice President Biden would be in Turkey? Well, again, I, I didn't. I just, she asked me the question about an update on Gulen's extradition, so I took advantage of the... <laughs> you took it. I did. <laughs> Seize the opportunity. <laughs> okay. When you said, again, when you said it's not related to the attempted coup, it means that there is not a single word in the documents mentioning the I coup? Or? I haven't read through the documents. My understanding is that these requests do not relate to the 2016 attempted coup. So, so the U.S. thinks that, the, the, that Turkey does not connect uh, Mr. Gulen to the I don't know the, I, I don't I can't say that we've made that assessment either um, you know you've obviously seen Turkish politicians and authorities talk about uh, or make allegations that he was connected all I can say is that this request does not relate to 
uh, his involvement in the 2016, or alleged involvement in the 2016 attempted coup. Can I move on? Of Can course. You take that yeah. It's an Israeli yeah. issue. Uh, sure. Yeah, but, uh, Can we stay on the no, Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Or, yeah. As many. <laughs> um, this uh, this uh, extradition request, can they um, add to it if um, in, in the future, or is this, you know, is, is that it basically in terms of what you're expecting from the Turks? And, it's a good you know. question. I, I, uh, uh, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not an extradition uh, uh, expert. Um, I, I don't know if they would have to, if they could add to it as you put it, or they would have to do another separate request. Um, and I, I, I can try to get that information for you. I just don't know the answer. Why do you think it's going to be Quebec? I think, but it's just yeah, a Yeah, uh, well, request. no, they're, uh, they're, uh, because in front of me it says requests. So, uh, they, so I so, think, and so we talked about this before, that we, sir, we, we received, for lack of a better word, tranches of documents or different uh, sets of documents, um, uh, materials, uh, if you will. Uh, so, um, again, I don't want to... Um, wade too deep into this because, you know, this is not a, uh, a public process, but, uh, you know, we're, we, we assessed those documents that we received and, uh, and we made a, that assessment that they do constitute a, an extradition request. I still, don't, I still don't understand why this took so long. I mean, it seems very, very silly to have had this debate, I think, for more than a month in public where the Turks are saying we've made a, an extradition request and where you guys are not able to say, yeah, they've made an extradition request. I mean, the State Department has Turkish speakers. Presumably, they didn't bury their request in the middle of a thousand-page stack of papers. You know, why, why would this take so very long? Uh, so, um, for one thing, I don't, I haven't seen the amount of materials, so I'd have to get more specifics about, you know, whether this was several hundred pages of documents, thousands of pages of documents. I just don't know. Um, but I also think, you know, partly it's, uh, it's a deliberate legal process and they had to look at the evidence, weigh it, and consider it and figure out whether perhaps more was coming. Uh, and that speaks to his question as well as, uh, you know, whether there was – whether we were waiting for additional materials to be provided. Um, but I think at this point we've reached an assessment that they have made a formal request that's not relating to the 2016 attempted coup. And was the request – sorry. I, that I don't know. I don't know exact date certain on that. I don't – Was the request – was whether or not what they submitted constituted a formal request in part contingent on the quantity or quality of the evidence they provided? Uh, so again, I, I, I you know I, I don't want to speak too much about the process, but there was an addition. There were some documents that we received uh, 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 initially. Sorry, initially um, that I think we talked about were not uh, part of a formal extradition request pertain to other uh, legal processes that are uh, requests. Um, and then there was an additional uh, tranche or, uh, of documents received after that. Um, again, I'm not a legal expert. I'm not a lawyer. Um, I think that uh, though that there needed to be a, uh, uh, a sober, deliberate assessment of the materials to see um, uh, whether they uh, actually uh, – amounted to a, a formal extradition request. But I don't have um, – I apologize. I don't have a lot of detail to provide beyond that. And there was only one additional tranche of documents, correct, or were there several? Uh, we talked about, uh, I think, uh, several, but some of the initial tranches were not, as we determined, were not uh, part of that extradition and, request. And do you have the dates on which you received the initial request and then the subsequent tranches of documents? I don't. I can try to get those for you. Okay. Thank you. Can we move on to the Middle East? Yeah. Senator Israeli issue. Yeah, uh, sure. Mark, I wonder if you have any comment. The Israelis, uh, according to the Israeli press, uh, Israel is planning for the first time in 10 years to expand the Jewish settlement in Hebron. First of all, are you aware of this report? And second, do you have a comment on this? Well, we have seen those reports, uh, Saeed, uh, that the Israelis are considering uh, planning to build homes for Israeli settlers in a military compound in Hebron. Mm -hmm. uh, Certainly, these reports are true. Uh, it would appear to be an effort to expand civilian Israeli settlement uh, in the city of Hebron, mm -hmm. and that would represent a uh, uh, deeply concerning step uh, of settlement expansion, uh, settlement expansion rather, on land that is at least partially owned by Palestinians. 
Uh, as you know, we strongly oppose all settlement activity, uh, which is corrosive uh, to the cause of peace. And we've said repeatedly uh, such moves are not consistent uh, with Israel's stated desire to achieve a two-state solution. And uh, just if I could follow up, also Israel issued the uh, orders uh, also in Hebron, in the hills of Hebron, for the to demolish seven homes and you know the, throughout seven families and so on, in, in a town that is actually not it's in, uh, it's a small town under the I think under the authority of the Palestinian Authority. So do you have any comment on that? You're talking about, uh, I think, Hebron Hills. Yes, the um, Hebron yeah, Hills, yes. Uh, we're concerned by the accelerated rate of uh, demolitions um, uh, undertaken by Israeli authorities um, that continue not just specifically in Hebron Hills, but frankly throughout the West Bank and East Jerusalem. And, and we raise those concerns with Israeli authorities. And lastly, on administrative detention, apparently Israel is uh, re-arresting Palestinians who have been released, and uh, they just um, – put them under administrative detention. I wonder if you have any comment on that, considering that the UN is calling on Israel to end the practice of administrative detention. Well, um, I, I think in general we obviously uh, believe all individuals uh, should be treated humanely and have their basic human rights respected and upheld um, uh, with regard to uh, the UN statement. I think it was about a hunger striker. Um, so, so. Right. Um, you know, our concern about administrative detention has to do with, uh, as I said, concerns about uh, uh, the fact that uh, all uh, prisoners, all individuals should be treated humanely and have their basic human rights upheld. Uh, with regard to the uh, resolution of any hunger strike, uh, we'd like to see a resolution uh, that does not result in the loss of life. Okay. but. You know, I, I've asked this over the years uh, on the issue of administrative detentions. What is the United States position on administrative detentions, especially that it goes on, you know, month after month, year after year, sometimes for decades, without prisoners being charged with anything? Well, uh, again, um, we respect uh, Israel's uh, right to provide for the security of its citizens and take uh, steps in that regard. Um, but I think with uh, administrative detention, uh, we always have concerns where we uh, – or we always, I think, raise con uh, concerns that we may have regarding uh, overly long administrative detentions, uh, ones that don't seem to uh, uh, um, be resolved in any kind of expedient fashion or, as I said, don't uh, appear to respect – and I'm, when I say this, I mean, you know, in terms of length, duration, uh, but don't seem to respect uh, the individual rights of those who are being detained. Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, according to Yonghan News Agency, three Chinese military planes entered an overlapping air defense identification zone of China and South Korea last Thursday without prior notification. Can you confirm the uh, report and do you have any comments? You're talking about, sorry, three uh, Chinese uh, military planes flew into an overlapping air defense identification zone with South Korea. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of those reports. I'd frankly, I'd refer you to the Department of Defense to speak to that. Uh, I, did you, I already spoke to you once. I want to get to that. I'll get back to you. Don't worry. Thank uh, you. Uh, we know that uh, China, uh, Japan, and uh, South Korean foreign, uh, foreign minister are holding a trilateral meeting in Tokyo today. So the uh, United States, the uh, United States, has any comment about that? Uh, sure. We, uh, you're talking, I think, about the foreign ministers' uh, meeting in um, Tokyo on August 23rd and 24th. We believe in strong, constructive relationships, uh, or relations rather, among countries in the region, promote peace and stability, and are in the interests uh, of the United States and in the interest, frankly, of the entire region, um, but uh, not, nothing to add beyond that. Okay. So uh, the Twin City Forum between Taipei and Shanghai is being held in Taipei, Taiwan, and China sent its um, highest level officials since Mr. President Chai took office, and this Chinese official 
attending the forum said, quote, the development of cross-street relations and cooperation should be based on a common political foundation that is the recognition of one China, unquote. Do you agree with his comment and do you have any uh, comment? Uh, can you just, uh, his comments one more time? I'm sorry. He said uh, the development of cross-street relations and cooperation should be based on a common political foundation that is the recognition of one China. Well, look, uh, the United States has a strong and abiding uh, interest in cross-strait uh, stability. Um, <coughs> there's been no change in our policy, which is uh, longstanding, uh, and that is we maintain a one-China policy uh, based on three communiques and the Taiwan Relations Act. Um, we also believe that cross-strait issues uh, should be resolved peacefully and in a manner, pace, and scope that's acceptable to people on both sides of the strait. Uh, oh, of course, sir. sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. So yesterday, activists uh, of a political party, MQM, in Pakistan, mm -hmm. attacked the Arab News TV head office, uh, my organization head office in Karachi. One person was killed, several others were injured. So what are your views about the freedom of press in a country like Pakistan? Well, we're, we've certainly seen the reports about these incidents. Uh, Pakistani security forces, uh, I think, have arrested several uh, members of the MQM, uh, the Mutahidi, uh, Mutahida, rather, uh, Kwame movement, uh, some of these members, and also sealed their headquarters. Um, we're also aware of yesterday's vandalism uh, of an ARY uh, news office in Karachi. Um, Obviously, the government of Pakistan would be the uh, best source for further information on these events. Uh, I would just say in a democratic society, uh, critical opinion should be encouraged, not silenced. Uh, we believe that democracies become stronger by allowing a free expression uh, from diverse voices uh, within society, and we would certainly emphasize that any expression uh, must be peaceful. Sir, one last question is about the Comprehensive uh, Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, the CTBT. So Pakistan proposed uh, to conclude a bilateral arrangement on nuclear non-testing with India. Pakistan is saying that if India agreed, then test ban would immediately go in effect, uh, creating a legally binding commitment without waiting for CTBT to enter into force. Um, do you believe such an arrangement will be consistent with the object and purpose of the CTBT? Well, look, um, we welcome this high-level dialogue uh, between India and Pakistan and encourage both countries to uh, engage in the dialogue and exercise uh, restraint aimed at improving strategic stability. Um, I think this proposal is something we would leave to India's consideration. Uh, it remains, uh, in our, our view rather, uh, it remains our view that the most practical way to achieve a legally binding commitment uh, on nuclear explosive testing would be for both states to sign and ratify the C CB CTBT. Yeah, of course. One is just a follow-up on the MQM uh, report. Yep. Um, do you have any concerns about the uh, arrest of the five senior MQM leaders and the, the uh, uh, you know, shutting down of their political headquarters? Um, I mean, does that – are you worried that that might be sort of political – an effort to silence political uh, – a political party, or, or do you think it's, it's, it's just part of normal kind of law enforcement after the – the incident yeah. at the, at sure, the sure. broadcaster. I mean, I think we're, you know, we're always uh, concerned when uh, members of a political party are, are uh, detained or arrested. Uh, we obviously uphold the importance and believe in the importance of public assembly, freedom of speech, as long as it's peaceful. Uh, and uh, and uh, we would emphasize that any kind of protests, any kind of demonstrations uh, would need to be conducted peacefully. Uh, so I think we're still assessing, gathering information about what took place, uh, and, and we'll reserve further comment until that time. Okay, one other Please. Point, if yeah. I, may. Um, I don't know if you've seen the reports from – or the report from the South Korean Yon, Yonhap News Agency saying that North Korea has laid new landmines near the, the Panmunjom, uh, uh, so-called truce village in the DMZ. Um, and I see that we have a – there's a comment from the U.N. – you know, the U.S.-led U.N. command uh, expressing concern about the presence of any device or munition on or near the bridge. 
but aren't the North Koreans within their right to mine as heavily as they wish their side of the DMZ, just as the United States and South Korea have really vast numbers of mines on, on the other side? I, mean, I think the concern that you note was expressed uh, uh, was uh, directed at the safety of people on both sides of the uh, MDL, the military demarcation line. Um, and that includes, obviously, thousands of visitors uh, who uh, take play or take part in educational tours of the DMZ. There, um, you know, obviously, uh, as you know, it, it, it would be in their rights to to, to, to uh, uh, on their side of the border um, uh, take these actions. But it just, uh, I think would only further exacerbate tensions. Uh, and as you said, it does pose a, a safety risk. Yes. A very quick one on uh, Ethiopia uh, yeah. related to the Olympics. Right. Are you aware of this case of this uh, Ethiopian marathon runner who earned a, a silver medal and who is apparently very scared of uh, getting killed uh, if he gets back to his country? And according to the BBC and the New York Times, is seeking uh, asylum in the U.S.? So I'm very aware of the case uh, personally because uh, I did watch the uh, marathon race uh, and I saw uh, uh, his finish. Um, we're obviously aware of the case. Um, uh, we would encourage all governments uh, to respect the rights of individuals to peacefully express their opinions. And that's whether they're inside or outside uh, their country of birth. Um, I can't speak about, you mentioned uh, asylum requests. Uh, we don't, uh, we're not able to legally talk about uh, asylum issues or asylum cases. Um, and that is something that is handled by the Department of Homeland Security. So I think broadly speaking, um, you know, we would uh, urge any government to uh, accept its uh, uh, returning uh, Olympic athlete uh, peacefully back into the country and to respect uh, any individual's right to uh, express uh, uh, their uh, uh, opinions, uh, as I said, uh, as long as it's peacefully done, and it was. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.